when it comes to some of the biggest games of all time, it's kinda hard to look past Rockstar's Grand Theft Auto series, and there's a reason why so many people look back fondly on these. You're not going to beat me down, fool! I can still remember playing Grand Theft Auto 3 for the first time and being really caught up in that transition from 2D into a fully 3D environment. And then likewise, years later when the series made the leap to the sixth generation of consoles, Grand Theft Auto 4 was a huge turning point not only for the series, but just gaming in general. Good shot, Jacob. Grand Theft Auto is just one of those franchises where you can always find people who want to talk about it, and although the preferences might differ from person to person, you can bet your bottom dollar that with at least one of these games, there's going to be someone out there who sunk some serious hours into them. For me, that was Vice City, which is my personal favourite, but then second after that was Grand Theft Auto 4, which I think is objectively the best game in the series. Well, since you put it that way... I mean. When this thing came out, it was one of those instances where even people who weren't even really into gaming would be talking about it. It just had that much of a cultural impact that you'd hear about it one way or another. And there's a reason why it's still got one of the highest aggregate review scores on Metacritic. Rockstar have been responsible for some pretty solid games over the years, but when it comes to the Grand Theft Auto series, I still think this is their masterpiece. Which is kind of funny now, considering at the time, I remember a lot of people complaining about how it was a bit of a step down from San Andreas. Alright, let me explain. Now look, I understand and I get all the complaints that San Andreas fans had about this in the way that it's removed a lot of the mechanics, and I get it, but the thing is I don't agree with it. San Andreas was an ambitious game, there's no argument there, but I also can't help but think that it was also just Rockstar flexing in a way. Do you know what I mean? Like, trying to see how much stuff they could cram into the game considering the limitations of working on the PlayStation 2 at the time. Yeah, I think people often forget that this thing came out on the PlayStation 2 first, with the Xbox and PC ports not being released until a year or so later. And yeah man, for a PlayStation 2 title, the amount of stuff they crammed into this game is just black magic. And if both this and the fourth game are cocktails, well, then I'd say that San Andreas is like a Long Island iced tea, packed full of different ingredients and intended to get you as drunk as possible. I hope you enjoy your meal. Whereas Grand Theft Auto 4 I'd consider to be like an old fashioned, requiring fewer ingredients but being much more smooth and refined. San Andreas was 33 square kilometers in size, whereas GTA 4 is only 16. However, unlike San Andreas, it never feels like there's wasted space here. It just felt like half of San Andreas was spent driving to the next location, and there's roads and highways between all these major cities where nothing ever really happened. Along with deserts and forests that only serve to help perpetuate the existence of those in-game myths. You know, like the ghost cars or Bigfoot. Every inch of Grand Theft Auto's map though, it feels like it's got a purpose, and it's always populated with NPCs, vehicles, or landmarks. And everywhere you look, there's something going on. It's kind of similar to Grand Theft Auto 3 and Vice City's map, and the way that you can break it down into these key islands. Grand Theft Auto 3, you know, also set in Liberty City, had Portland, Staunton Island, and then Shoreside Vale. Vice City, on the other hand, had the beach, and then the mainland. San Andreas, on the other hand, has Los Santos, Red County, Flint County, Bone County, where your mum hangs out, Whetstone, San Fierro, Tierra Robada, and then finally Las Venturas. And a shiny new donkey for whoever can say all of those five times fast without stopping to have to catch their breath. Grand Theft Auto V also felt kind of directionless to me, being this amorphous blob of an island which, outside of Los Santos, just felt like it lacked any kind of direction or anything all that notable. GTA 4 though, back again in Liberty City, is broken up between essentially four islands. You got Broker and Dukes, Bohan, Algonquin, and then Alderney. With a short drive really being all it takes to get from one to the other, and each of them being unlocked as you progress through the story. It is much simpler, but it's also got the bonus of everything feeling connected. Which is also why I don't really see it as an issue that you can't buy property anymore, considering everything's so close to begin with, and wherever you need to get is just a short taxi ride away. Here we are, the beginning of our new lives. Again. That's actually probably worth mentioning too, because now if you're keen to just get it done and get to the next location, you can essentially fast travel to anywhere in the city on a taxi, even pulling some poor customer out of the back of these things if it's already occupied. You're getting raw! Don't get killed! What are you doing?! Plus the city just had some really cool landmarks, from the carnival rides at Firefly Island, the very time Square inspired Star Junction, and then the airport, which was the hangout for multiplayer games. San Andreas had stats for stamina, lung capacity, respect, and sex appeal through to the skills for weapons and driving, as well as different martial arts styles to learn. 
GTA 4 again does away with all that shit. You can hop into any vehicle and drive it as well as you do in the first mission right up until the end. In terms of sex appeal, about the most you might get is one of your girlfriends commenting on what kind of clothes you wear during a date, but that's about it. It ain't pretty, is it? And instead of three martial arts styles, well, you've just got one, comprised of the age-old technique of just punching or kicking someone in the face, which is fine to be honest, because the melee combat always kind of played second fiddle to shooting people. Oh, you think I'm a joke? You eat burgers and hot dogs to regain health now, not gain weight, and there's no system for improving stamina or how long you can sprint either. Plus, it doesn't force you to do missions at certain times of the day either, which I really appreciate. That's the way it works. And how can I not talk about those end of mission jingles and that music you hear during the loading screens? I mean, look, I'm a Vice City simp until the day I die, but it is impossible to deny how memorable that theme tune is. <laughs> But what I appreciate even more than that though, is the streamlining of all the weapons. This time around, compared to the 38 weapons in San Andreas, this time you've only got 16. But it's a much tidier collection and you'll use pretty much all of these at one point or another. I look at it again in the sense that every weapon has like a basic, but then a more effective variant. So your first weapon's gonna be a semi-automatic pistol, but then later on, you'll get the Desert Eagle inspired combat pistol. The Uzi is eventually replaced by a more effective submachine gun, the shotgun with an auto shotgun, the AK with a carbine rifle, and a bolt action sniper rifle with a semi auto version. And of course, what would a Grand Theft Auto game be without an RPG? More than that, though, the gunplay is just immensely improved from the previous games. I don't think I'm out of line here to say that the shooting in the other games is just kind of awful. I mean, it was definitely at its peak for San Andreas, but I don't think you'll hear too many people sing in high praise about the combat in those games, and they really do still have some of the most awful lock-on mechanics. Grand Theft Auto 4 came out around the same time when cover shooting was becoming the norm for third-person shooters, with games like Gears of War 2, so it makes sense that they'd adopt this format. But yet, somehow it still feels different from the slew of other shooters that we'd get in the ensuing years. And I think there's a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, I think because it's almost tactical in a sense, compared to the other games, 5 included, where the guns are just basically lasers, the weapons in the 4th game have to often be fired in short bursts, or else the weapon spread would get so wide that you wouldn't be able to hit jack shit. The controls have just the right amount of input delay to feel like there's weight to your movements without feeling like you're moving around underwater, and there's bullet velocity to consider too if you're shooting at someone off in the distance. But I think secondly and more importantly is just the god tier physics engine. Holy shit! Grand Theft Auto 4 uses a physics engine called Euphoria, and unlike a lot of other physics engines, which just kind of turned everything into ragdolls, Euphoria looks way more realistic. I'd kind of describe it as like a combination of reactionary but also corrective. When shooting someone, for instance, they'll realistically topple backward from the force of getting shot, but that's really only scratching the surface of how they tried to implement this into the combat. Early on, they showed off really well during a mission where you got to, like, steal a car, and the poor owner either has his hand caught in the door or is just too dumb to let go. Either way, though, watching this guy get dragged across the road as you're trying to drive off just looks awesome. And it's something that carries across to almost every single aspect of the animation. What I think makes it really impressive, though, is how the physics are trying to correct themselves. So if someone's shot or knocked over, well, they'll eventually try to regain their balance. And if someone is wounded but not killed, well, you'll even see them limping away, trying to get out of the firing line. Yeah, emphasis on trying. Excellent. I just can't get over how awesome some of this stuff looks, even by 2022 standards. And there's a reason why Rockstar have used this in every game they've made since. Yeah, it's come a long way since San Andreas when you simply shot someone and then there was just some kind of basic animation as they fell to the ground. Even the water physics are just really impressive, which is something that's kind of downplayed a bit, only because there's not really too many missions that take place in a boat, but the way the water moves around here and reacts to vehicles and explosions is just really ahead of its time. The Wanted systems also had a bit of an overhaul. Now, in the previous games, if you had like a one or a two star rating, there wasn't really any kind of threat to the whole thing. And if you just drove to the end of the block, well, then the cops would often forget you existed by that point. In GTA 4, though, it's a little bit different because once the cops are onto you, they're now tracking you down within the general area. 
and the only way to then get rid of them is to get out of their line of sight until things cool down, but that's often easier said than done though. I lost the heat, where are you? Because if you're trying to get away from someone and you run into another cop, well then that radio system completely resets. And once you get like a 3 or a 4 star rating, well then it becomes pretty damn tricky to lose these guys. Eventually too, like the other games, if the heat gets too much, well you'll even have the army coming after you. I mean, it is a more realistic system, but at times it can also be kind of annoying, because other cops are quite literally just going to appear in front of you out of nowhere. And if you're trying to drive quickly in a straight line, well, then it's often going to reset the search pattern. I think it's really just another way they've tried to change the way that driving works, you know, to make it more about being smart, losing the cops around corners and outmaneuvering them, as opposed to just having the fastest car and outrunning them. Oh yeah, speaking of the driving, a huge complaint you heard from a lot of people back in the day was the way that the vehicles handled. Mostly I think just by people who were mad that they couldn't take a corner at full speed anymore, pull up the handbrake and just not spin out. Honestly though, I've always loved the way that the vehicles handle in this. I think everything has a really good sense of weight to it. And a lot like San Andreas, when you're driving a rear wheel car for instance, you really feel like the power is going to the back of the tires. It's just a much more deliberate driving system. You know, it's more like the French Connection than it is the Fast and the Furious. And you will feel like you're engaging in some of the slowest car chases ever, but the skill needed for getting through these I think is much higher. Pull up, jump. Having said that though, you can still get some baller cars like the Infernus, the Comet and the Banshee, and these things are gonna haul ass, you know, till you crash anyway. <laughs> At which point you can appreciate the new damage modeling, which is just insane. Like being able to smash out their individual headlights or dent the front of the car to the point that the engine just stops working entirely. Please start. Plus I really like too how cars don't just magically explode now when they're flipped. Yeah, anyone who's played the other games knows that flipping cars was pretty much the kiss of death. Then you'd have to GTFO before the stupid thing exploded. Thankfully, this doesn't happen anymore, and unless someone puts a bunch of rounds into the fuel tank, it takes a lot more to make these things blow up. That's a good thing. You can even swap now between normal and full beam headlights, you know, if you really want to, and even wash the cars if they get too dirty, which I've got to be honest is a bit of an unnecessary feature, but kind of shows how Rockstar tried to take every full advantage they could to make this game feel like next gen. This is also the first Grand Theft Auto game that made me look both ways before crossing the road. Yo! And compared to the other games where getting hit by a car just knocked off a few health points, here though it can pretty much outright kill you. That was naughty. I can't believe we ate all that crap. Oh, no. Get out! As will supermaning out of the driver's seat if you crash, because apparently no one ever taught Nico what a goddamn seat belt is. Ah! But you know what? In reality, that kind of makes sense. I mean, if you're a criminal carjacking innocent civilians and getting into high-speed chases with the cops, well, you don't really want to be fumbling around with the seatbelt if you've got to get in and out of your car really quickly. <laughs> but look, I won't pretend this whole thing is perfect, and you'll definitely see those instances where a vehicle has a mind of its own and the physics start to shit themselves, but it mostly still stands up to modern standards. And it's a bit of a testament to the black magic that Rockstar managed to pull off with this engine. However, none of that really matters if there's not a good story to back the whole thing up. And I do think that this is probably the best story in the entire series. What starts off as a story about a man just coming to Liberty City to start a new life and chase the American dream turns into an outright crime epic. Who are you working for? Uh, my cousin, Roman. <laughs> Goodfellas, Once Upon a Time in America, Scarface, Grand Theft Auto 4. Hooray. And what I've always loved about this is that it's just a game that feels like it's getting back to its roots. That being playing as a completely neutral character, being paid by other criminals to do the wet work. Seems this guy does not respect the waste management business. Well, this city is one big open sewer, but I'm gonna need some non-union help. And at the end of the day, that's all I ever really wanna do in a Grand Theft Auto game. Is that so? I mean, I appreciate where they tried to take the story in the fifth game, but the plights of a has-been heist man getting cucked by his wife's tennis coach or an edgy psychopath trying to push meth in the LA desert is just far less interesting to me than the struggling underdog is. 
It's kind of I've always thought that Franklin should be the one and only protagonist for the fifth game. You know, at least you have to keep it consistent with the playable characters in these stories, always being niche down on their luck nobodies, with Lint being the only thing lining their pockets. Screw you, you idiot! When Neko first arrives in Liberty City, he's broke as a joke and helping out his cousin Roman for a little bit with his struggling taxi business. See, not everything I tell you is bullshit. I bet most of it was. <laughs> but soon after that, he ends up doing jobs for the Russian, Irish, and Italian mafia along with a bunch of more colourful characters along the way. Come on, touch my backs, man! No, thank you. Eventually making some serious tax-free coin. And being someone who almost has to pay half of what he earns to the government in tax, well, there's no greater power fantasy to play as, let me tell ya. Alright, I bet you're gonna rock that look, bro. Although a lot of these characters are scumbags and soon dealt with accordingly, there's still some really likeable characters here, and even the ones that aren't that likeable are still memorable. Especially the bad guys, most of whom I don't think get enough love when it comes to convincing using assholes in fictional media. Oh, shut the fuck up! My fucking wife is watching television! <laughs> Good lord. What are you doing? <laughs> They've evolved past just being caricatures and they all seem much more realistic, which is probably held by the increase in quality for all these cinematics. Nico as a protagonist is really about as neutral as they come, and that's part of what makes the guy so likeable and relatable. The guy turns down alcohol and drugs throughout almost every single story-based mission, and rarely does he ever force someone's hand outside of events involving Roman. Nothing like a bit of sarcasm when someone's got you by the balls. Every single major decision this guy makes is handled by the player, putting them in control of the kind of person that he's going to be. So if he executes key NPCs during missions, well then that's on the player's hands. <laughs> Compare that to Trevor, for instance, in Grand Theft Auto V, where you really felt like you were just sitting in the cockpit of this murderous psychopath, doing the kind of things that even a 14-year-old edgelord would probably be embarrassed by. <laughs> More than that, though, is that Nico is written to be a funny, you know, genuinely funny guy at times. Sorry. Some of the dude's reactions to the crazy situations he finds himself in are just hilarious. You've been a bad boy, Mr. Balkan. And the boss is not happy. Oh no, I <laughs> shit my pants. Not yet, but you will. <laughs> yes, and for an annoying dick, you're really an annoying dick. <laughs> Thanks, Nico. Thanks a bunch. Is that better? March! You think it's okay to kill my employees? If he is an asshole, yes. Easy. I think it'll be a bit more taxing than hanging with Manny on the streets. <laughs> Not so. For one, I won't have to listen to him talk. <laughs> <laughs> he begins the game pretty much just like a deer in the headlights, completely culture shocked in this brand new country, and being fed lies and bullshit from his cousin Roman about the kind of life he lives. <laughs> Two hours later. <laughs> so he has to adapt to it pretty damn quickly, and luckily he has a very marketable set of skills. Those being a knack for driving pretty good and killing people who need to be killed. And although he's not afraid to slap a bitch when necessary, he's never portrayed as being a bad person. I mean, there's one point where you have to decide between killing off a key character, and during the cinematic, he just outright says he doesn't even want to do it. But I don't want to. Neither do I, man! The few times he does get reminiscent about the events he went through in Europe, and his disdain for the people who put him in that position showed that he's actually a decent human being. Plus, it's also kind of wholesome how protective he is about Roman. Yeah, it's about family, and that's what's so powerful about it. Sit down! No! I'm not going to stand here and have you call me disloyal. I think the only thing that bothers me is how, like, even later in the game, he's still complaining about how Roman's spending all of his money, which seems a bit silly to me. You know, at the point when money has become completely trivial, and you're walking around with, like, 400 grand in the bank. ...and steal to scrape together a living so that my cousin can fritter it away online and pay off debts. But in terms of GTA protagonists, I mean, this guy's up there with the best of them. He's a cool guy. The GTA 4 also has the distinction of having some of the absolute best bros in all of gaming, bar none. Oh, oh, hey, love for cinema, no, no. You know, in real life, most men are lucky if they can find maybe one or two different guys they get on really well with. I'm talking someone who is always on the same wavelength as you are. They know what you're thinking, what you're going to say, and they have the same taste in movies, TV shows, and alcohol. Someone like that with that many shared interests is what you call a bro, right? And GTA 4 has at least five characters who feel like they could be bros. Hey man, did you just call me? No man, must have been someone else. Yeah, yeah, must have been. You've got little Jacob, Brucey, Dwayne, Patrick, and of course Roman. 
Nico, it's your cousin. You want to shoot some pool? And if someone in a video game is the type of person who you'd want to hang out with in real life and get a bunch of beers with, well, then I consider that good writing. Next time, I will try and win. Little Jacob, for instance, is ride or die with Nico pretty much from the moment you meet him. Bruce is a juiced up beefcake, but he's never anything but super cool. And that guy's alpha male mindset is hard to not appreciate. Hey, be careful, man. I heard that stuff does funny things to your balls. Even Packy pretty much welcomes Nico right into his family. And by the end of the game, he's almost like a brother to him. Maybe if being a drunkard doesn't work out, you can be a comedian. Fuck off! <laughs> yeah, and speaking of brothers, you've got Roman. And I know that he and Nico are cousins, but there's like a bond there that becomes almost like siblings. I just did! It, it, it's good to have you here! You end up working for almost every single male member of his family, even deciding the fate for two of the brothers. You can date Packy's sister, Kate, who is one of the few genuinely good people in the game. And the amount of self-control she has to not jump Nico's bones is just astounding. That's my ma. Nice to meet you. Hi. And this is my sister. Lovely lass, scared to bits of life. You actually end up caring for these characters and what happens to them. And again, I think that's part of what I didn't like about Grand Theft Auto V, was that I just didn't really care about any of the people that I interacted with. Michael and Trevor, for instance, felt more like the type of people you'd be doing missions for in any other Grand Theft Auto game, you know, instead of actually playing as them. And hopping into the shoes of both those guys, along with Franklin, who, like I said, should have been the protagonist, just kind of felt like it watered their stories down a bit too much. Grand Theft Auto 4 focuses primarily on Nico and the relationships he has with all these characters. And on those times when they call you up and they want to hang out, because I like them and I'm engaged, I always end up dropping what I'm doing to go off and chill with them. Hey man, it's me. Let's play dogs! There's also an end game to hanging out with these guys because the more they like you, you'll end up unlocking benefits to each of them. Little Jacob gives you access to this discounted armory in the back of his car, meeting you nearby to sell you a veritable arsenal of weapons with just a phone call. Isn't a star. And Roman will send out a free cab to meet you at your location and drive you anywhere you need to go. It's almost kind of like Uber before Uber was even a thing. It's also a system that carries over to the girlfriends that Nico can date. Yeah, again, another example of this game condensing things down from San Andreas, with only three side bitches to manage. And these girlfriends come with their own rewards as well, like restoring your health or getting rid of your wanted level. Hey, Carmen, I'm not feeling so good. What can I do to get better? Poor baby! Just apply pressure to any wound. Call Carmen later, okay? Thanks, Carmen. I'm starting to feel better already. Power up! These are also some interesting characters in their own right, like Carmen, the cock-hungry nurse who talks about herself in the third-person perspective like she's Jimmy from that one episode of Seinfeld. You want me to come inside with you? Carmen wants you in here! Alright! Jimmy down! I do think the dependency these characters have on you is kind of overstated. I mean, I've seen people going on about how clingy these guys are as if they're like an actual domestic partner or something, which I've got to say is just bullshit. Because outside of scripted moments where these guys call you during missions, it's really not that common for them to call you to want to hang out. And I mean, shit, man, I wish my friends in real life called me up as much as these guys do. Nico, Roman, we should go and get drunk together. Plus, if it really bothers you that much, I don't know, just put your phone in-game onto Do Not Disturb, because yeah, that's just one of the many quality of life features that this game has. This isn't a good time, Roman. I got another type of shooting on my mind. And that's the key word here, life, because playing Grand Theft Auto 4 really does feel like you're taking part in this living, breathing world. And every little aspect you can think of is present here to make it feel true to life, even just down to having to stop on the bridge between islands to pay the toll. This was the first game I played on my PlayStation 3 where I really felt like I was playing what everyone was calling next-gen gaming. And it's still the most comfy and believable city I think in any video game ever made. There's just something so lifelike about the way the city moves and breathes, and regardless of the time of day or where you are, there's just always activity and something going on, which is perfect for it being set in a city that never sleeps. Basic things like watching pedestrians walk down the road, checking their phones, or holding coffee cups. If it's raining, you'll see these guys out with umbrellas or jogging to get out of the weather. When you carjack someone, the animation is actually different depending on what weapon you've got equipped. You know, assuming you've got one equipped at all. Don't try anything stupid. Cops can now also arrest you too, which you can actually resist if you want to just make a getaway. Get in, 
One of the most immersive things you can do is just hop in a taxi and sit there in the back seat gazing out the window as it drives around the city. And there were times when I'd do this and leave my console on, you know, for background noise while I cleaned my room or did something else around the house. Yeah, this was in the days before those 12 hour long ambient clips on YouTube. The radio stations don't really hold a candle to Vice Cities, which let's be honest is the apex of the series even to this day, but it does a good job of capturing the era that it's set in. When you switch a station just as Kanye West is coming on, you know, back before Kanye went fucking crazy, or swap to the jazz station as Chet Baker drops, well, it's a pretty damn good vibe. Two thousand and seven and two thousand and eight were really around the time when smartphones were starting to become a lot more popular, and this might be the first game to ever really implement them in such a profound way. Mostly just used to call your buddies, but also used for exposition when someone needs to call you to spout off a bunch of dialogue. It's a seamless way to integrate new and important information into the game without removing the player from the world itself. Yeah, why is can't see? I can't leave but I come with you. Where's the place? What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. I think it's also the first game to introduce a GPS system for getting around. And yeah man, I'm talking old school GPS. You know those old Navman systems that used to take like a dog's age to find a satellite signal? I once drove from Sydney to Adelaide with one of these things and it died about halfway through the trip, forcing me to pull out the old street directory to find the rest of my way. And I think if that happened to Zoomers nowadays, you'd end up finding their car wrecked on the side of the road somewhere their half decomposed skull still sporting that stupid fucking bird's nest hairstyle. He's a cool guy. You can also stop off at any of the internet cafes around the city too to log onto the internets and check your email, not to mention downloading ringtones and text sounds. And that really takes me back to the days when I used to spend five bucks to get the Back to the Future theme as my ringtone, or the Metal Gear Solid Alert theme as my text notification. I don't even know if internet cafes are like a thing anymore, but thanks to Grand Theft Auto 4, their memory sure lives on. It's just such a detailed city, and I feel like every time I go back to replay this thing, I find something new that I never knew existed. Like, I only realised on my recent playthrough that if you take too many photos of the girls at the strip club, you know, even for scientific purposes, well, it pisses off the security guards. It all looks about as good as you'd expect an almost 15 year old game to look I suppose. Visually it's kinda hard to quantify because the GTA games have never really been known for having amazing graphics. Even for the time I think Grand Theft Auto 3 and Vice City were far from being the best looking games on the PlayStation 2. And by the time they finally hit the PC well they were just outright dated. I still think Grand Theft Auto 4 looks pretty good all things considered, though it's definitely been a series that's more about the style and the aesthetic over being like a visual juggernaut. This might be one of the first games to really popularise the whole super realistic graphics trend though when it comes to graphics mods, and you can still find people to this day going back and installing mods and E and B tweaks to make the game look more true to life. It also comes from that weird era in gaming where everything was intentionally trying to be like grey, brown and muddy, you know, to make the whole thing seem more gritty and lifelike, because apparently the real world only has like three or four colours as well. It does work in that regard, I suppose, because Liberty City was always supposed to be the kind of place where good morals go to die, and the harbour of the bay is no doubt lined with dozens of people wearing cement shoes. On the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360, Grand Theft Auto 4 is always locked around 30 frames per second, and the PC port needs a fair bit of buggery to get it above that. So I think the best way to experience it now is on the Xbox Series X, which gets it running at almost 60 frames per second almost all the time, even if it still won't change the fact that you're playing an early 6th generation console game. What I think is most noticeable going back to play this though, is that sort of cheap like depth of field effect that they try to use here, where objects close to the player are sharp and in focus, but then everything off in the distance is all kind of blurry. And this whole thing's been done I think to try to emphasise the scale of the city, and to make it seem bigger than it is. Which I guess does work, and is no different to how fog worked in the other games, but it does mean that at times the visuals can kind of look pretty crappy. And outside some of the main characters, you're gonna see some really dated looking character models. Hooray. This engine got a lot better looking the more that Rockstar used it, and I think that Red Dead Redemption still looks phenomenal. And eventually even when Grand Theft Auto 5 was released, well, that was a bit of a looker for the time too. But as for this first iteration of the engine, well, you can definitely see the cracks here and there, and the image quality is definitely lacking. But I still think it holds up for that one basic reason. It has soul. You know, soul is a valuable thing. What should go by is the pendulum swings. 
And it doesn't matter how old a game is, man. Soul is timeless, you know? When Grand Theft Auto 4 is just covered in it. It's practically dripping with the stuff. Let's get the fuck out of here, homeboy! It's kind of hard to properly explain what Soul is, but I think the best way to describe it is when every single element comes together to create a truly engrossing and powerful experience. In this instance, it's because you really do feel like a criminal living in this organism of a city that always exists around you. From wearing crappy Russian import clothes at a dollar store to wearing swanky suits and working for the elite of the elite, you never feel disconnected from this journey. Why are you telling me this? A no better example of all these elements coming together is what I think is not only the best mission in the game, but also one of the best missions in any Grand Theft Auto game entirely. And that's the bank heist mission called Three Leaf Clover. Get on the floor! Now! But sir! You too! Okay, okay! This feels like Rockstar's homage to Michael Mann's Heat, where Nico, Packy, and his brothers execute a bank heist on Liberty City Bank. It's one of the longest missions in the game, and also one of the hardest, taking place not even halfway through the main campaign. First off, you've got to drive the crew to the bank, listening to everyone bicker along the way. Once arriving at the bank, the heist begins, and it all seems to be going to plan until Packy and his brother start arguing, where, during the distraction, a civvy with a concealed carry permit pulls out a gun and shoots one of them. Fuck! Oh. We told you not to fuck with us! Oh. Point to note too is that the guy he's talking to is Lewis, who's going to be the protagonist for the Ballad of Gay Tony. Luis! But this ain't such a good idea, bro. And along with Johnny, this guy starts to pop up here and there for the rest of the game. We put the ice in the middle, we walk back. Anyway, after leaving the bank with the cash shoved into a few duffel bags, you find the entire street is full of cops. And the scariest thing at this point is how no one thought to have some kind of escape vehicle. So you gotta haul ass down the middle of the street here, gunning down everyone who gets in your way. Maybe if these guys weren't smashing back beers and doing lines of coke before the heist, they might have had the foresight to think of this. Either way, it makes for some pretty intense firefights. You've got cop cars pulling up to block the exits on the streets, forcing you down all these narrow alleyways, and to say it's epic is selling the whole thing short. After a chopper shows up, you're then heading underground. There's too much panic in this town. Moving through the subway tunnels where yet again more cops show up to try to stop you. And how Nico isn't the most wanted man in Liberty City after this is anyone's guess. But needless to say, this mission has the highest body count in the entire game. Finally, when you reach the surface again, you've still got to get rid of your wanted level, which is no small feat given it's about three stars, and you've got to make sure that the guys surviving don't get killed either. Keep in mind too that this is old school GTA before Rockstar added in checkpoints or any of that stuff, so if you die at any time or any of the guys in your squad die, then you've got to do the entire thing all over again. From picking up the guys at Packy's house and driving them across the town, through to committing cop genocide in the streets and the subways beneath Liberty City. But man, once you finally finish this mission, it's all worth it. I still remember the first time I played this. I mean, I want to say it maybe took me like three or four attempts to get through it. But seeing that payday come up when it's all done and dusted is a damn good feeling. You earn 250 grand here for beating this mission, which is massive. Considering you've only been making a few thousand bucks a mission beforehand, and you really feel like that's money well learned here, considering how hard you had to fight to get it. I always thought that this mission on some level has to be the basis for all the heists they added in GTA 5, and about the only issue is that it's really the only one in the entire game, and everything after that's a lot more restrained. That's not to say it's bad, and I can name plenty of other missions I still find highly memorable. Follow me! I think that shootout to try to rescue Roman from the Albanians is really fun. And that whole saga about kidnapping the Mafia Don's daughter is also one of the most entertaining. When my daddy hears about this! Not to mention confronting the demons of Nico's past and helping him get resolution. Hello, Nico. Hello, Mr. Bulgarin. Now, keeping in line with Grand Theft Auto spin-offs, Rockstars would eventually release two DLC campaigns for GTA 4. Episodes of Liberty City with the Lost and the Damned and then the Ballad of Gay Tony. Both taking place in Liberty City around the same time as the events in the main campaign, however, both of these couldn't be more different in tone. Lost in the Dam lets you play through an entirely new storyline as Johnny the Biker, who showed up in, I don't know, like two missions I think back in the main story, usually working alongside Nico. And what this whole art covers is the power struggles within their biker gang when their president is released from jail. And then the working relationship that Johnny also has with Elise Batter, a drug dealing minor character from the base game. Wouldn't be the first man I tried that trick on, sweetie. The only thing is, bros, Grand Theft Auto 4 had 30 odd hours to build and develop all these relationships and dynamic between all these characters across the lengthy campaign. Here the DLC attempts to do that in a fraction of the time and it doesn't really succeed. 
the story starts with these complete strangers established as being really good buddies with Johnny, which is fine, but that's not the relationship that the player has with them. And Johnny's former brother in arms, Billy, who gets released from prison during the opening, is unlikable from the get go. So, Johnny boy, where's my bike? And instantly starts forcing these guys to do all these kinds of dirty work. We lift this ship right now, and every deadbeat on the East Coast is gonna come after our chapter! So right off the bat, you don't even give two shits whether this guy lives or dies. I put some mescaline in with the weed, Dave. <laughs> so I'd be very careful if I were you. <laughs> Johnny's whole on and off relationship with his addict girlfriend Ashley is supposed to make him seem more endearing, I guess. But to be honest, it just makes the guy look like an idiot. And I don't really understand how this otherwise confident and smart dude can somehow be in a relationship with this girl who spends more time with a crack pipe than she does with him. Well, my whole life's falling to shit, sweetheart. And even after having played Grand Theft Auto V and seeing what ultimately happens to Johnny, it just makes the whole thing even more redundant. I think all anyone plays this for are those brief times when you get to see Nico and the other characters from like a different perspective. Nico, this is Johnny. Kind of same reason why I watch all of those crappy Marvel movies and TV shows, you know what I mean? On like the off chance I'll see Captain America or Daredevil. It's also dumb too how early on the gang is told that one of their members is killed by some kind of European and then missions later Johnny meets Nico and it somehow doesn't click that this could be the guy responsible. I got a new guy going along with you, he's from Eastern Europe somewhere. Yo, hey man. Now playing as a biker, a big part of the DLC involves cruising around on your hog and you can even call your buddies in for backup at any time too, which is kind of cool. Now you know, only a chapter head like Billy can ask for that kind of help. You'll spend a lot of time here cruising around with your boys and listening to Alice Cooper, Deep Purple and Motley Crue. It's a bit of a testament to how good the licensed music is in this game, you know, capturing the feeling and the mood of the person and the world you're caught up in. But the thing is, is that riding a motorbike is way more dangerous than driving cars, you know, almost like how it is in real life. And you just make it so much more likely to be shot or killed when you're driving a bike that there's just no good reason to use these over cars. I think honestly too, like 90% of the missions in this DLC end up with you having to outrun the cops and you know, lose your wanted level and trying to get away in a motorbike when you've got like a 3 or 4 star rating is just fucking suicide. If you can't see the inherent tactical advantage here and trying to drive away from people shooting at you on a motorbike, well, look, I don't know what to say. <laughs> So although the game wants you to immerse yourself as this cynical, grizzly biker, you actually put yourself at a disadvantage by doing so. Plus I really hate that lack of variety here too, how like every second mission is just about losing the wanted level. And look, I know that fighting back against the police has always been a key theme in Grand Theft Auto games, you know, maybe even more so for this DLC now, where you're playing as a biker with the whole core idea of fighting back against the man. But at least in Grand Theft Auto 4 there was some kind of variety to it. You weren't just always shooting cops and running away from law enforcement. The worst ones are where you've got to also escort someone, and there are a few things more annoying in this world than playing a Grand Theft Auto game and waiting for an AI character to hop into the car with you when you're under duress. The only other thing I think worth mentioning is that this DLC adds in a few new weapons, though most of these aren't even all that good. There's an automatic pistol, which is just incredibly inaccurate. There's a sawn off shotgun, which is an insult to sawn off shotguns all around the world. There's a pipe bomb, which is more or less just a reskinned grenade, and speaking of grenades, there's now a grenade launcher. And this thing might have actually been good if it exploded on impact, except it doesn't. The only new gun that I liked here was the automatic shotgun, the old street sweeper with its drum mag, and I don't think there's ever been an iteration of this weapon that I haven't fallen in love with. From Resident Evil 4 through to Max Payne, it just slaps so hard every time it shows up. Otherwise though, I mean, 1 out of 5. Yeah, I don't like those odds. You bitch! This was actually the first time I went back to play this DLC since it first came out, and I don't know if it was the fact that I played it back to back with Grand Theft Auto 4, which probably wasn't a good idea. Either way though, I just didn't find this very fun to play through. It's not entirely Rockstar's fault though, I mean trying to make something like this after GTA 4 would be like Martin Scorsese making Goodfellas, and then he goes to try and make some kind of spin-off starring Frankie Carbone, one where he drives around all day making coffee for Jimmy. Come on, make that coffee to go, let's go. Yeah, so come over, Joe, won't it? As for the other DLC, well, that's the Ballad of Gay Tony, and again taking place during the same timeline, but now having you play as Tony's bodyguard and friend, Louis. Louis or Louis? Ah, Louis. Hey, my nigga, what's that? 
On a positive note, though, this is way more fun to play through. Yeah, what's wrong with you, man? The Lost in the Damned is like going to a funeral for a bunch of people you barely know. Gay Tony, on the other hand, is like being invited to a party where everyone already knows your name. That's the whole central theme of this DLC, man. Partying. There's even mini games where you can hang out in a nightclub and dance with women and get laid in the bathrooms. Nice. The main story here eventually revolves around when Nico and Packy kidnap this side character, Gracie, which took place near the end of the original campaign. Lewis and his buddy Tony, who were really only throwaway characters in the base game, now play a much more central role. I'm such an idiot! With Gracie being close friends with Tony and Lewis just being caught up in everything out of some kind of allegiance. It's kind of funny though that they call it the Ballad of Gay Tony, considering he's not even really in it for the first few hours of the story. Most of this time you're going to be going around doing jobs for other people to help pay off his debts, one of whom happens to be Brucey's brother, Maury. Tony owes you money. Tony's my boss and my friend. So I'll help you out a little. And another being a rich Arab property developer named Youssef, who is one of the funniest motherfuckers in the entire series. Sure, bro, sure. There's not really any point to any of this though, again just outside of those brief glimpses where you get to see someone like Nico. Lewis is one of the poor folks who was stuck in the bank when Nico and the McCreary's rob it, and then later on he directly ambushes Nico's diamond deal at the city museum. The other times you get to see Roman and Brucey are actually kind of funny and almost worth the price of admission alone. And why they didn't just make a spin-off featuring these two guys is anyone's guess. Could be like a whole saga here where they go out to nightclubs every night trying to get laid, only to fail, end up drunk, and eating kebabs at 3am. You know what's even sadder is that that sentence right there sums up most of my early 20s. Ladies, hide your titty. Apart from this though and seeing Gracie a lot more, it doesn't really teach us anything we didn't already know. Yeah, Gracie's a coke and a cock loving loudmouth at the start of the DLC, right up until she gets kidnapped. And I actually think I hated her even more after finishing this. Ooh, what is wrong with you, man? You are ruining my bus! Lewis is a likeable dude though, even if he uses the F-bomb like it's a full stop, and the word bro like it's a comma. But by this point it just kind of feels like there's a real been there done that vibe to the missions, and outside of a few standouts like using someone as target practice on a driving range, or parachuting off the tallest building in the city, it's otherwise standard stuff. <laughs> The few times you have to fly a combat chopper are actually kind of awful, and how no one thought to put in some kind of crosshair for this thing is just beyond me. Also, in a lot of the combat missions, they often put enemies above you, and memes aside, whoever has the high ground in a situation like this always has the advantage, making the shooting in these sections needlessly hard because you can barely get line of sight on who's attacking you. There's a club management minigame here too that is just completely pointless where you put on a business suit and have an inflated ego, then have to keep an eye on security around Tony's nightclub. And at least if there was like something you could unlock from this, like maybe generating revenue for the club or something similar, it might have been fun. But it's just this world building mechanic that has no real purpose. I don't want to see you again! Nice work, Al. The new weapons, though, I do think are pretty awesome. You've got a Dirty Harry style 44 auto pistol, which is just a damn hand cannon. There's a new submachine gun in the form of a modified P90. Again, awesome. Now what you want? Another version of an automatic shotgun, this time an AA-12, which has explosive shells. And I mean, that right there is just filthy. Along with a new semi-automatic sniper rifle and a belt-fed light machine gun. There's sticky bombs too, which are actually kinda useful. And not only used for a bunch of missions, but just pretty effective during general combat. It also seems that Gay Tony does away with the whole dreary, piss and shit soaked filter from The Lost and the Damned, making the visuals I think look the best that they've ever looked in. The nightlife this time around looks vivid, colourful, and bustling, and again, man, it's a definite vibe. They've added a bunch more new songs to the soundtrack here, and the sad part is I actually remember listening to some of these back in my 20s when I used to go out to nightclubs. I even had a bit of PTSD cringe here, remembering all the cheesy pickup lines I used to use, and thinking about the money I spent buying tequila shots for women who would disappear into the crowd the moment that shot glass was empty. You're pathetic. It's almost kind of more Saints Row than GTA at times too, with all these dancing mini games and the option for booty calls with all of Lewis's many flings. 
but it's still like the Ant-Man of video game expansions, and no matter how hard they try to make all of these new characters interesting, they still can't hold a candle to the OGs. Yeah, I think maybe you're taking the tough love thing a little too far, man. Nothing else though, I'll give Rockstar credit in the fact that playing through these again, the memories of all these key moments did come back to me. <laughs> And in fact too, like replaying Grand Theft Auto 4 to do this video, I think was probably the first time I played through the entire thing in maybe a decade. And again, what surprised me there the most was how I remembered all of these key moments like I'd only just played them yesterday. That right there, I think is how you can really tell when a game is something special, when you can go back and replay it 15 something years after it first came out and instantly be transported back to how you felt the first time you played it. That shows that it has a timeless quality, which is something that few titles can make claim to just one of those games for me alongside things like Doom, Max Payne and Metal Gear Solid 3 which I feel seem to be kept in like this timeless void and they never seem to age. Grand Theft Auto 5 would eventually build upon almost all of the things that 4 helped to implement like the friend system, using your smartphone and it would also reintroduce a lot of the stuff that it took out of San Andreas like customizing vehicles. It obviously heavily upgraded the multiplayer component too, and there's no doubt that GTA Online has helped in keeping the lights on over at Rockstar for the past few years. I mean, it sure as shit wasn't the GTA Definitive Edition, that's for sure. But again, like San Andreas, adding back in all of this stuff has kind of made it seem less focused on the whole. And looking at it now compared to how it was on launch, it's almost like an entirely different product. Grand Theft Auto 4, on the other hand, stands the test of time as this gritty, well-told story about a likeable European man and his escapades in a giant cesspool of a city. I'm sure whenever Grand Theft Auto 6 comes out, whether it be sooner or later, you know, because of those idiotic leaks we've just had, it's going to no doubt build upon that formula that little bit further, but the archetype that the fourth game set is still the one that holds up the most. And the fact that everything since has just been a slightly better version of what they pulled off there really shows you how crucial and important that game really was.